Good morning, um, and thank you for joining us for this opening session of the Ideas Network 2030 Summer University. It is great to see so many friends from the UK and across Europe here with us today. I'm Caroline Newton. I'm a director of the Ideas Network 2030, and I'll be moderating this panel this morning. Throughout the session, I'd encourage you to submit your questions using the box below the video link. Please keep the questions coming and I'll bring them in as I can. This session is being recorded and will be available later on the Ideas Network 2030 website. Now, before I welcome our panelists today, I'd like just to send best wishes on behalf of the Ideas Network 2030 to someone who cannot be here today, and that is our president, the Right Honourable Damien Green MP. Uh, Damien has supported and helped shape this initiative since its first inception, and we are delighted that he's agreed to take on the role as our first president. He was due, as you will know, to be taking part in this panel today, but very regrettably is sick and is unable to join us. We send him our very warmest wishes for a swift recovery. In fact, this last weekend saw every member of our advised panel, uh, our advertised panel falling by the wayside because of illness and other emergencies. So I'd like to extend a particularly big thank you to all our panelists today for joining us at what was frankly quite short notice. Um, but frankly, they're such, uh, they have such erudition and knowledge that I can't quite think why they didn't comprise our panel in the first place. So I'll give a brief introduction to our panel members. Uh, firstly, to Stephen Hammond, MP. Uh, Stephen is the Conservative Member of Parliament for Wimbledon and is the Deputy Chair of the Conservative European Forum. Uh, Tommy Hootman, who is the Executive Director of the Wilfred Martin Centre in Brussels. Angelos Chrysogelos, who's Senior Lecturer in International Relations at the London Metropolitan University and an Associate Fellow of Chatham House and Felix Dane, who is a director uh, of the Ideas Network 2030 and formerly the director of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in London, where he worked to intensify Germany's relations with the UK and Ireland. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. It's a real pleasure to see you. So this is the opening session of three days of discussion and debate about the strategic issues facing the UK and Europe over this next decade. Uh, in line with the mission of the Ideas Network. So to kick us off, I'd just like to ask Felix Dane to give a brief introduction to the audience about, to, about the Ideas Network 2030, to explain a little about what the initiative is trying to do and um, trying to achieve. Uh, so Felix, thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, and a uh, very warm welcome to everyone also from my side. The challenges the UK and the EU are facing up to 2030 are manifold. And uh, I mean, in principle, we all do know these challenges. There's digitization, there's the role of China, the rise of China, there's the retreat from the US, there are pandemics, climate change, intense political polarization in Western societies, and so on and so forth. But we always have faced challenges. I mean, there was a Cold War, nuclear war threat, um, World War One, the Spanish flu, World War Two, whatever you name. Um, we have always had times of relative calm, but the constant is that humanity faces challenges uh, and has to rise to them or not. And we at the Ideas Network 2030 wish to foster the element that causes us to rise to these challenges. We see this element as the underlying connection, the strength and values of, the, of a people who share a way of looking at the world, who share a history, and who have a plan for a joint future. And it is this underlying value that we at IN2030 are trying to foster. One of our main focal points is therefore dialogue, because only through dialogue you can achieve this. And um, the dialogue in general has suffered a great deal in, in the past years um, for two reasons mainly. A is the, the, the polarization in our Western society. And when it comes to the UK and its neighbors, in particular through the Brexit process, which uh, left wounds on both sides. Now, how do we try to do this? It's chiefly through activities, basically. Um, we are trying to improve this dialogue between the UK and its continental partners by bringing speakers from both sides of the channel together, as we do today. We also did so in the past, and we continue to do so. 
And we are therefore in particular grateful to our partners in this endeavor. This is chiefly the Wilfried Martin Center, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, and the uh, Conservative European Forum. I thank you all for your support because without you, we couldn't have made this happen. So thank you very much for being with us today. And these sessions, we try to develop cre and create ideas um, and steps regarding how to foster this dialogue, in particular for the younger generation of thought leaders. That is very relevant to us. And although these are there is an intrinsic uh, value to dialogue and analysis um, as it strengthens uh, who we are, or at least also um, who we view ourselves to be, Without practical examples, this all remains a conversation for philosophers. And this is why we also want clear policy proposals. And like the summer university, all our activities consist of uh, open dialogue sessions, but also of closed door, smaller working groups, where we try to develop ideas um, of how to move forward. And these proposals are then afterwards shared with relevant stakeholders on both sides of the channel and uh, also published on our website. And we wish you all to engage there as well, because uh, we like it not to be a one-sided process. And I wish us therefore all a fruitful discussion, for, and I'm very much looking forward to three days of uh, intense and stimulating debate. debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, so with that introduction, um, I think that sets very clearly what we're trying to do and why we're so delighted to have our panelists today. I would like to start this, um, the, the meat of this opening session, please, by asking Stephen Hammond if he would please just give us um, a few minutes on what he sees are the main challenges facing our region, the continent of Europe and uh, the UK. Caroline, thank you very much and good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you, Felix, also for setting out what the Ideas Network summer meeting is hoping to do this year. I think it looks to be a very exciting program and I'm looking forward to joining uh, some of the sessions. Um, uh, Caroline referred to the fact that uh, you were expecting to hear different speakers today. I was I was remembered of the my old friend Amber Rudd's story where she um, she got called up at the last moment and said, would you like to appear on Newsnight tonight? And she said to the people phoning up, um, well, why don't you try everybody else first and then come back to me if you can't find the speaker? Uh, and when I said that to my old friend Liz Spencer today or yesterday, uh, it became clear to me actually that, that I was the last on the list. So it's, uh, But it is a great pleasure to be able to speak to you today. I wanted very briefly to set out three sets of challenges. Uh, and the first challenge, I think, is the challenge to what everybody on this call, I suspect, has taken as the norm and a belief, uh, a belief set for the last for their lifetimes. And I would argue has extended through the uh, establishment or the political establishment of much of Europe uh, since the Second World War. The prevailing orthodoxy in the developed or the West has been liberal democracy a rejection of populism and nationalism, a building of uh, fairer societies, in inverted commas, whatever we might take that to mean, and I'll give that some illustration in a moment, uh, a building of uh, multilateral relationships. And if I look at the UK uh, from 1940, you know, 1946 onwards, really, the Beverage Act, the Education Act, the Full Employment Act, in the, uh, uh, the creation of the National Health Service, the signing of NATO, the accession of the Queen in 1952, were a huge change to uh, the pre-war era and a movement to, in, to uh, change in society. And then another rapid change in terms of the abolition of capital punishment legislation, uh, legislation to enshrine in, in equal rights, equal pay uh, across uh, legislation to, to uh, stop and uh, change uh, discrimination on grounds of disability, sex, sexual preference, and generally a removal of the class system. And as I said, the establishment of the United Nations, the joining, uh, the establishment of NATO, the establishment of the European Union. There has been a widespread consensus about the uh, power and the achievements of for want of a better phrase, liberal democracy. And the reality is that I think that that, uh, 
that is under challenge. Uh, and many see that uh, in Brexit. Uh, and I think it is fair to say that Brexit, uh, if uh, as someone who is a well, was a very well-known high profile uh, campaigner for Remain and a campaigner for a more harmonious, what I saw as a more harmonious relationship uh, post uh, the, the referendum in the United Kingdom. The, the central reality is that in UK, cultural divide and therefore a rise in populism has undoubtedly been one of the factors behind it, but one of the factors behind a real change in the UK. And I see that change not only in the UK, but in other parts of Europe as well. And I think that the issue for, for, for my country, the United Kingdom, is you know, there, is, uh, there is a rise in, uh, I think, subliminal racism. It is extraordinary that you, know, you have one of our mainstream parties and party leaders being accused of anti-Semitism and his inability probably stacked in reality that he was unable to reject that charge. We have seen you know, a rise in anti-immigration, a rise slightly in isolationism. And that strikes me that one of the challenges, therefore, for all of us who believe in liberal de uh, democracy over the next few years is that we must start to reject the sloganism of politics, the coarseness of national discord, the superficiality of national discord, which if uh, well then, well then obviously inevitably goes into international discord. So uh, my first set of challenges, and I, and I said out in a headline, is the challenge to our belief set, or what has been the belief set of uh, certainly the centre right um, and the centre and the centre. Sorry. Um, the second challenge I think I just wanted to raise is is clearly the challenges there, and um, both Angelos and Tommy have mentioned uh, the role of Europe, the role of Brexit. It is pretty clear uh, to me that in terms of Brexit, uh, it, it caused the UK to be left uh, to question its place in the world. And I think that both in uh, trade and in global security, um, the geopolitical and the geography of where you are uh, is important. And one of the issues I think for the continent both the UK and the European Union and the and wider Europe is how it confronts establishing a relationship on trade and and on uh, security uh, in the face of some fairly major threats, some of which were laid out by Felix at the beginning. But you know the the rise of China uh, and the potential of I suspect some significant uh, flashpoints over Taiwan. We have just seen the uh, whole Western debacle in Afghanistan uh, and therefore how the relationship between the UK, Europe, Europe and the rest of the world develops is going to be crucial. Uh, and, and I think that part of that has to be that the United Kingdom and the European Union need to accept that it's going to be a complex relationship. My personal view is that until the French elections are over, there is little chance of making real progress uh, on the future of our relations. But it, you know, it is it is a real concern. I think that you know, there are a number of flashpoints in that relationship, but both sides need to de-escalate. The biggest clearly may be Northern Ireland. You've seen you've seen tension there, but that you know that is that uh, sums up in many ways or is the microcosm of a number of the problems, the problems over security, the problems over uh, trade are, are a microcosm in the, in the Northern Ireland. And I guide uh, colleagues to, uh, after this conference later in the month, the Conservative European Forum is producing a paper on Northern Ireland. And I think that the, just as I think that uh, perhaps uh, other countries in the world have accepted the reality of Brexit, uh, I think particularly the Americans, um, much as I think that it's clear that they, they're disappointed by it, yeah, they do see that 
Britain and the, United, and the European Union need to replace it, uh, repair its battered relationships. And that will require, uh, I think, some multiplicity of arrangements. It's no good one side just saying you can only negotiate with this and another side saying um, we're only going to do bilaterals. There will need to be uh, some, some, I think, uh, understanding on both sides that maybe the bigger issues that the UK wishes to deal with can only be dealt with by dealing with the Commission, but there must be scope for some bilateralism as well. Uh, I, I say that because I think uh, there are going to be a number of uh, fallouts from still, which are you know, five years on from the referendum, still uncertain. But it will be important to the centre of Europe and Europe's international position. And I think it directly relates into my first set of comments, which is that you know, the rise of nationalism and populism uh, can, affect, can affect, I think, the power of Europe uh, as an international force. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear to me that some of the tensions internal to the EU uh, could well be driven by uh, a challenge to that belief set. Uh, well, I know that uh, there are many other comments uh, and we could talk about this, I suspect, for the whole of the hour, Caroline, but I won't. Uh, and my final, my final thought is, is the challenge of technology, because if one looks at uh, technologically where we thought we were in uh, the 30 years ago, for instance, um, before many of the participants are, are on this next two or three days uh, were born, you know that that was the advent of email. Um, and you look now, uh, you know, at the possibility of what mobile telephony, smart telephony, uh, and all that has brought uh, in terms of the way our society, uh, the way our society is organised, the way our society has a quality of life. And the same thing I think is going to be happening in the next um, few years uh, post COVID uh, and the ability to use technology for AI, uh, for the manipulation of data, uh, for increasing automa automa automation, automation and digitalization. Uh, and I say that because um, it's not just the simplicity, oh, well, it, we, you know, we may have faster speeds on our smartphones. This, this will go to uh, how we how we organise our health systems um, with the manipulation of AI and data. It will go to how our economies and our lay and our labour structures within those economies are altered. It goes to how our education systems are formulated because of the, the requirement for new skills. Uh, and it clearly, uh, the it will give rise uh, to potentially a number of international security issues. So. Uh, whilst the challenge of technology and much of it, and I haven't even talked about infrastructure, which is one of my specialist subjects, um, whilst the challenge of technology and what technology can bring um, is undoubtedly usually and can always be for, used for a force for good, it can also be a, it can also be a power uh, for disruption and discontent. Now, undoubtedly, the disruption can be organized in a positive way, but some of the security backlash may be concerning. So I, I give you those, uh, I think that's probably my 10 minutes up, uh, but I give you those three sets of challenges. Challenges to our belief, challenges to Europe's position, uh, both internally and not just Brexit, and externally our relationships with you know, China, Russia, uh, America, uh, our continent of Africa uh, and the Far East. Uh, as alongside those. And finally, um, how technology is going to change our world in every aspect of our lives. Uh, and I, you know, I think that I hope that there'll be a number of sessions and a number of questions looking at that. But with that, I will, I will use up my 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that um, tour of the very broad horizon of issues facing us. Um, I feel there's plenty for the Ideas Network and others to be doing over the next decade. Um, uh, just to remind you, before I ask Tommy uh, to, to give us his thoughts, uh, just to remind you, do please um, continue to send uh, questions in on the on the chat box. Uh, so, Tommy Houtenen, uh, what are um, some interesting things raised there by by Stephen? I'm sure some of them um, are ones that you would focus on yourself. What what do you see as the main issues facing us? Thank you, Caroline, and um, welcome everybody to our opening uh, opening session. And first of all, I would like to thank Damien Green 
um, James Sellers, you Caroline, Felix, of, of doing such a good uh, job of putting up this summer university. Also, Gus, Matthias Barner, who could not be with the, with, here with us. Just to, uh, before we uh, go into the points, go into the challenges, just want to kind of say a few words only about uh, the motivation for Martin Center to, to do this summer university, to have this debate, and why it's such an important thing. Long story short, the Martin Center is the think tank of the European People's Party. People's, people, European People's Party is the largest uh, coalition of uh, center-right parties in Europe. And traditionally, United Kingdom and especially Conservative Party has been the source of inspiration of our member parties uh, uh, during all these uh, decades. And many of these discussions uh, have been continuing here in Brussels uh, and, uh, and those uh, connections. But now, because of Brexit, we are, in the, we are in a new situation, and that's why this platform is very important for us, and we want to we want to invest on it, and, and, and we greatly enjoy this event. So th thank you for that. Now, as Felix pointed out, we have a long list of challenges of which we could choose. I have got the two, three. I don't claim that were, those are necessarily the biggest ones, but I think those are the topics which we should be discussing among the topics we are discussing in the years, uh, future years. Um, surely, one mentioned by Stephen Hammond already is, of course, the UK-EU relations. It is not only a minor regional issue. It, indeed, it relates greatly on the topic that we will be discussing on these days. It's the whole future of the West, future of the Occident. Uh, what happens is that in, in the core of the West has been the the United States, continental Europe, and UK, where the UK has played the crucial part on being the connecting factor. And now we are in the situation, because let's face the fact, the US slowly, slowly is starting to look more on the East, on Asia, while we, as Stephen mentioned, have our own dynamics. And something is off the of place. And for that, just to keep our, the, the, our value set and value framework, work to together EU, uh, Europe and UK, uh, but of course EU and UK need to need to have, have a good, uh, good relations. Then, as, as mentioned, again, Stephen already went to that direction. This relation is also important for the future, not only for Europe, but for the, uh, for the EU. UK has played during the decades crucial role of, uh, you know, uh, pushing the EU to the I would say to the right direction in issues of trade or free market, etc., etc. Et UK is not directly on those discussions, but still indirectly can play and will play a very important role. And, and if we have this antagonist situation, it will not be good for UK and de definitely for the future of Europe and uh, EU. And of course, then you have a you know, set of other uh, positive aspects which, which, you know, which could come if we continue positively move forward in our relation. That's the, of course, for many to mention, security cooperation. We see now in latest events in Afghanistan, how important this, it is, but then at the same time, how difficult it is. Of course, from the UK point of view, you know, when UK cooperates with the EU or Europe, with whom it cooperates, well, it most likely will cooperate with individual member states, because in fact, we speak about when we speak about security cooperation, the challenge is not only between the European countries and UK, but of course among the EU uh, member states. And uh, there are many issues that I already mentioned: the whole challenge of climate change, etc., etc., etc. But of course, we have a, a set of challenges. So the big question, actually, in UK-EU relations, is whether we are able to keep the, you know, to look the big picture, or whether we get stuck in the technical, more technicalities. And the challenge is uh, big. Now, if you look at the political debate, both in, I would say, in UK and in European side, EU side, the Brexit is, is not in the priorities. If I look at the UK news, Brexit doesn't play much of the role. You may have a different opinion. At least in EU side, it's, it's not a very important topic. Now, is that good news or is that bad news? It might be good news if you continue to work on, uh, on a set of issues while not having this huge political pressure all the time from media and, and, and those politicians who are 
uh, have the temptation to play in a populistic way. It can be negative if it just leaves the issue. It's not an important. It's uh, you know that this temporarily broken relation becomes permanently broken, and so there, there is the challenge. The other, other, of course, you have again a set of challenges. The Irish question, Irish border question, where you could say that maybe the UK. You know, government maybe have an interest to keep this now, this uh, uh, the protocol discussion open, uh, and maybe uh, decouple the whole Irish question with the other set of uh, questions. From the EU side, the strong tendency to support the island and and keep that on the table. So we will see if those kind of like the fisheries, like the uh, financial, uh, uh, you know, financial service sector issues which we have opened, those details become an issue which hinder us, our cooperation in a more uh, global level. And of course, you know, the latest uh, AstraZeneca in the beginning of the year, AstraZeneca, the, you know, dynamics and, and, and the, the issue and the debate and how it went, you know, we, we have to seriously think, is this the, the way we want to cooperate in the future? And of course, you know, there is much to thinking which needs to be done also in the, in the EU side. Okay, uh, I have, uh, you know, only couple, some minutes left, so I quickly go to two other challenges, I, I would say, uh, would like to underline. Debt crisis and transformation of economy. So I think for the centre-right, uh, center uh, the economy is always uh, one of the main uh, uh, issues. But now what we have is a challenge. Since 2007-2008 crisis, and especially now after a uh, pandemic, what we are seeing that the economic debate has totally changed. 2007-2008, the conclusion was that why it was so, one of the conclusions was that the, uh, the reasons why it was so uh, uh, big, big economic uh, impact here in the continental side big was because we were not ready enough to make the clear for the markets that there is enough liquidity for governments and uh, governments to maintain their position and the euro to survive. And as a result for pandemic, the, the situation uh, came and when the crisis started, the conclusion was that we are going to float the market with money. And that's what is hap has happened. And, and currently, the, the, what we see that the economic uh, crisis is, is, uh, is less, but the problem for us and the right is that, that the narrative has, uh, has changed. You know, this, we are living the leftist stream. To be uh, to be frank, there's so much money. The discussion in the member states is where to use this uh, all, all this uh, all this money. There's even discussion of uh, in this situation in many countries of the four day uh, four day working weeks. Quite the, and in that environment, for us, which have been fiscal conservatives, that that's a very challenging environment to uh, to to. To do politics and uh, and uh, communicate, so that's one, and not to, of course, to count the economic risk. All the you know, the stock market is disconnected uh, from economic reality. Uh, they say red flags all uh, are up, and and many you know most of the economic experts are saying that we are going to have a very challenging you know possibly crisis in the upcoming years. And third, the last point, and Caroline, I will be very. Uh, short is one which we were supposed to have a, a panel on on friday which is a demographic uh, crisis uh, so aging of the population globally and in europe long story short the narrative has they say, so there's a global dimension and an internal european dimension the global dimension is that the narrative has been that the population is going to go up until 2100 then go rapidly down what we are seeing that actually it is possible that already 2060 and 70, the population will decline in many places very quickly. It will cause huge problems for Europe, but places like China, it will become a, a big, a very big issue, much more having impact, much more than we think. And then the question is, for example, Africa, what uh, what, what will happen there in the in the end of the, this century? The main growth of population will be in Africa, and so will the Africa then? become the place to go or place really not to go because of the crisis and the conflicts. And there the challenge is, of course, the Europe. There will be not maybe millions or 10 millions, but maybe hundreds of millions of people wanting to have a better economic future. And that can be, become a huge problem for Europe. Those are my three points. Uh, thank you very much, Caroline. Back to you. 
Thank you very much, Tommy. Um, yes, and I'm, I'm grateful that we're going to have an opportunity through the next three days to explore some of those issues in uh, in greater detail because they clearly, all of them, um, merit longer discussion. Um, Angelos, um, I hope that within the the areas that have been identified so far by Stephen and uh, Tommy, there's some space for your the priorities that you think we need to be looking at over the next uh, decade or so. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Um, and uh, I'll start by saying that as a European living in the UK, uh, it's actually uh, the um, the initiative uh, that you take this event and the rest of your work, and of course in uh, conjunction with the uh, Martin Center, is actually something uh, very very important uh, for me to see that uh, you know people are still trying to maintain connections between the UK and the EU. I think this is absolutely. A vital moving uh, moving forward, uh, and uh, if I may say on a personal level, it actually makes me feel slightly better uh, living in this country. Um, so I think I have a bit of uh, there's still a bit of an overlap with what we've heard already, but um, I think I can still focus on some issues that perhaps have not been spelled out very um, clearly, although hinted at by the previous uh, speakers. So speaking about some of the challenges uh, for um, uh, the UK, the EU, and of course this relationship takes place within the broader framework of the transatlantic uh, relationship. Um, one challenge that I see moving forward is the question of protectionism. Uh, I think we, we are operating now under a changing economic paradigm. Both of the previous speakers mentioned that uh, already. Um, although they did mention primarily questions of uh, domestic uh, in the domestic setting. Um, I think this paradigm plays out in the international sphere as this new paradigm of uh, protectionism. Uh, there's all kinds of buzzwords uh, uh, moving around where you basically try to articulate what was originally a very populist and anti-systemic idea as kind of some a very serious uh, policy suggestion, right? So we have the notion of the strategic autonomy of the EU. Uh, in America, we have Biden saying that you should buy uh, you should buy American. And I would argue that even the UK, uh, this uh, this mentality has driven policy post-Brexit. You have this big push of trade deals whereby, you know, global Britain tries to show that it still remains a pro-free trade uh, force. Uh, but essentially, the mentality behind it is still very much uh, kind of uh, my country first, uh, my country first uh, mentality. And you see that also in many other things that take place behind the headlines of the new uh, trade deals in the UK government, there's still a strong mentality about uh, supply chains, about, um, uh, you know, which country is going to have a, a sovereignty control over the internet, data, new technologies, and all those things. So I think protectionism is a really, really uh, big problem moving forward. And the main problem I see is especially that it is one issue that uh, will divide the transatlantic uh, area uh, amongst itself, right? It's not something that would pl plays out only as the West versus China, uh, but as we see now with Biden having maintained tariffs um, on the EU and the ongoing uh, clashes between the UK and the EU over the implementation of the Northern Ireland uh, Protocol, it also pits the UK uh, versus the EU. So protectionism is something that really undermines the unity of the transatlantic uh, area. It essentially makes the US, the UK and the EU into three separate uh, islands, and I think this is very problematic moving, uh, moving forward. Uh, the second challenge that I see, and I think it was already touched upon um, uh, by Tommy uh, particularly, is uh, the fact that I think the pandemic has uh, intensified uh, prior uh, economic uh, inequalities and prior uh, challenges within the labor market and within the uh, economy. I think we are in a danger now, uh, which I, I, I would actually call this the perils of our recovery, right? I think we are in the danger of moving into the coming years into uh, an environment where we will be seeing a lot of positive indicators because our economies will be recovering from the recession of the pandemic and the lockdowns. But we do know from the mm -hmm. economic crisis uh, after 2008, that recoveries in modern Western economies tend to be very unequal, tend to be very incomplete, and they tend to leave people uh, on the, um, they tend to leave people uh, behind. And the danger here I see is that the way that the pandemic was managed with lockdowns and restrictions, which I believe were to some extent uh, inevitable, are intensifying pre-existing um, uh, divides of inequality uh, within uh, societies. We saw that, for example, 
example, during lockdowns, there was this new cleavage between essentially people who could work from home and people who could not work from home or people who were not allowed to work because they had to work uh, outside of home, such as small um, business owners. Uh, a lot of this sentiment, I think, finds expression in a lot of those irrational things that we see around us now, the debates about uh, vaccines and kind of uh, denial of science. But I think we would um, dismiss those things or just these irrational uh, anti-scientific reactions that are at our own peril. I think the pandemic leaves our societies even more uh, divided, even more unequal. Cool. And as Tommy said, while splashing money at the problem uh, is not a solution, I personally think it's necessary to kind of have an immediate rebound, an immediate recovery, uh, but it would be a mistake to think that more structural changes are not needed. And then the final challenge uh, I see, and uh, that was particularly mentioned uh, in our first intervention, is what I see as the problems of uh, ideological uh, polarization uh, in our societies. And here I would like to raise the issue, uh, I think that I would like to raise the issue that uh, perhaps we should move beyond just the framework of right-wing populism uh, that we have used to uh, talking about uh, over the last uh, four or five years. Right-wing populism is definitely a problem and it's not going away, but we also do see now around uh, of uh, a new, uh, very vibrant and a very emancipatory agenda coming up from uh, the left. And you know, we also have all these debates about so-called culture wars, uh, which, by the way, I avoid like the plague. I don't. I, I really try not to get into any of those things. Uh, you know, I'm also uh, I'm also a lecturer, so you know, I really you you feel like you're walk, walking on eggshells with some of those things. Um, a lot of this agenda is actually being picked up by the young, and I think here that's also another reason why we should not dismiss it. A lot of questions about LGBT rights and, uh, you know, reckoning with uh, post-colonial past are things that, you know, are worthy debates uh, to have. But I think the impatience you see and the dynamism with which you see that being uh, reflected or expressed by many young people ties in with what I already discussed about, the fact that also our economies and our societies don't seem to be offering an easy way out for uh, these, um, for these uh, generations. And ultimately what this builds up to is what I think is this uh, double-edged problem for liberal democracy, whereby you have kind of this identitarian, uh, right-wing, anti-immigrant populism on the right, and you have this kind of social liberalism uh, on the left, where you have problems such as cancel culture and uh, all those things. Uh, while they're not the same, I think what they share is this fundamental distrust of the process of liberal uh, democracy. And liberal democracy is kind of stuck in the middle uh, and is not able to address both of those challenges um, at the same time. So finishing off what I think all of those things add up to is a very new political environment. I don't think that the framework of uh, good liberal democracy versus bad right-wing populism that we were used in the previous decade holds that much. I think there's new agendas and new uh, challenges being uh, re-articulated and recrystallized into new uh, political phenomena that we will see in the future. Just before the pandemic, we had the Gilets jaunes phenomenon, which was very difficult to pin down politically. Uh, my suspicion is that we'll be seeing more amorphous, non-ideological, perhaps even non-partisan challenges to the way liberal democracy works. And these challenges will be crystal, will be kind of drawing on both social, ideological, and economic uh, shortcomings of our, uh, of our systems. And I think that those things can only be dealt with if the main forces of the transatlantic area, the US, the UK, and the EU, manage to coordinate how to address them. But at this time, it seems that every island is for itself in trying to address the immediate challenges. And I'm not very optimistic that there is a political will in any of those three uh, poles to come together and work those things out in the immediate future. Okay, thank you, very sobering. Um, just turning, Felix, or oh, before we turn to Felix, just a reminder, do by all means uh, put some questions in the chat if, uh, if any spring to mind and you'd like me to put them to the panellists um, in the minutes we have left. Uh, Felix, just turning to you and um, uh, picking up on what all the speakers have talked about, uh, about the, um, the um, cohesion of the EU itself. Um, we've seen, haven't we, here, I mean, we know so well, only too well in the UK, how the domestic politics of a member state 
can have an impact on the EU. Um, and clearly over the next 12 months or so, we're going to see quite a um, potentially quite pivotal changes in the political landscape in, in Europe. Stephen referred to the French elections. Obviously, we have the German elections coming up later this month. Um, I just wonder if you could give us um, your sense of the extent to which these will mark a real pivotal change for the EU and the future for the EU over the next decade. Well, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, that is uh, a very open race still ongoing in Germany. And of course, uh, the impact depends on who wins these elections. And <laughs> the problem is that we don't know at this stage. There's really no clear winner. Um, what is uh, surprising is how the Social Democrats have picked up in the race. In the beginning, they were at around 15 percent and they are nearly about 25 percent right now. And um, the interesting bit I find is that the people of Germany are not particularly fond of any of the three chancellor candidates. So there seems to be a bit of a mismatch between um, the parties uh, and their candidates and what the, the German people really want. I think after 16 years of Chancellor Merkel, um, there is some sort of a, of a mood for change. People want change, but then again, Germany as a whole does not like radical change. And so they are stuck in between those two. And, uh, and I think the impact on the European Union depends, of course, um, who makes it. I think on the general foreign policy side, um, the impact will be marginal. The, the, any, any of these parties is totally pro-Europe in, in the sense committed to EU integration and, uh, and upholding the value of the EU institutions. Um, it will also, um, any of those parties will, will push for, for a uh, strengthening of, of the transatlantic relations, which have suffered a great deal recently. So I think those, those general guidelines will be continued um, regardless of who wins. But when it comes to practical terms, of course, if the Greens um, win the race, uh, I think we can see drastic changes when it comes to climate change policies, when it comes to lobbying within the EU on those policies. So I think there will be there will be an impact, but but not as great as 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 one might fear if it's not the Greens. That's what I would say. Okay, thanks. Stephen, can I just come back to you, please? Um, and talking, looking at the um, the normalisation, which we hope to see of relations between the UK and the EU, which I think we would agree is probably quite important, very important for the um, for developing these themes and our approaches to them as we as we go forward. Do you is what is the sense in the Conservative Party, do you think, and in particularly in the, the Parliamentary Party, towards a normalisation with relations with the EU and bilaterally with the member states? Uh, so I think that uh, it's very interesting to hear what Felix was just saying. I mean, uh, my point, Caroline, was that I think that on both sides at the moment, uh, until we get through the French elections, there is a, a tension where in the UK, uh, as has been mentioned uh, already, that there is a view that everything Brexit is wonderful and that uh, it's all gone very well. And this is an oversimplification, but in, every, in certainly in other parts uh, of the EU, because it helps with the um, making sure the EU doesn't fracture further, not that I think it is going to, but also a part of the campaigning strategy that everything uh, Brexit is awful. Uh, and therefore, you know, there is, I think, until that normalization of politics goes away, therefore, I think that, you know, I, I'm pretty pessimistic about, you know, progress being made. And that's why I mentioned Northern Ireland, I think, is a fulcrum of where relationships are going to be very difficult over the next six months. Looking forward, I mean, I think the problem, uh, there's several problems. Uh, but first of all, the very nature of the Conservative Party uh, and its beliefs on Europe have changed very dramatically. The main, if you were to, if we were, if we were sitting here seven years ago, the mainstream belief, even with the rise of um, what was UKIP at the time and the re-emergence of some anti-EU uh, elements inside the Conservative Party, the vast majority of the Conservative Party thought the EU was an institution which needed reform, but frankly, British membership was taken as a given because of our economic and diplomatic. Uh, influence across the world. 
and also it was in terms of our own economic benefit. The extraordinary shift inside the Conservative Party that from what was the norm to what then became the norm only two years later, I think was uh, a mark of how a relatively small group of people can change the dynamics. Uh, and even in 2016, if you look at the members of the Conservative Party elected in the House of Commons, over 60% of them were professed voting for Remain. At the 2019 general election, uh, with the change of membership of the Parliamentary Party, uh, there is a professed uh, at least majority now, if not a what of people who actually voted Remain, uh, sorry, who voted Brexit, uh, and also quite a change in the mainstream thinking of the Conservative Party. Now, I think that there are a large group of what I would call uh, pragmatic leave uh, consensus within the part party that recognizes that uh, in the future, uh, normalization of our relationship, whatever that may be, and I suspect it's going to be a closer relationship on trade, a, an easier relationship on movement. One is already seeing some concerns being raised over yeah, it's very basic, you know, the 90 day rule uh, across Europe, the inability to you know, see mismatch of labor streams. Um, so I, I think there will be, but I, I'm very skeptical about how long that's going to take um, uh, for, for both sides. And, you know, the point I was trying to make rather badly was that, um, you know, in yeah, absolutely one gets the point about uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. And, you know, I'm clearly of the view that the UK has signed an international relationship and we shouldn't break it. But if we are looking to make progress on that in the future, then the EU has to think about, uh, as much as the UK needs to keep to its commitments, the EU needs to think about why it has more checks on a small piece of border than it does on the whole of its eastern edge, for instance. Uh, and that point was being made, I think, very, de very eloquently by... Uh, my chairman David Liddington just recently in a speech. Uh, you're just sort of finding ways forward. And David, of course, having been a former Northern Ireland spokesman, is, is acutely aware of a number of the sensitivity. Yeah, and the point I was trying to perhaps make is that if we want to make progress, then there are going to have to be not only major issues which uh, have a cross European aspect to them but I think some of the normalizations of relationships will need to be on a bilateral basis well and some there there may well be some which can progress faster than other even if there is a general movement forward so I suspect there will be for instance in an area I know very well um, a want for a, a agreed reciprocal healthcare policy across Europe back to where we were five years ago uh, and if the European Commission sets out a broad framework it may well be that some countries want to move faster than others on that, as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. So I am skeptical about progress being made in the short term, but perhaps more optimistic that progress can be made on a three on a three year view. Thank you. Angelos, I could see you trying to intervene then, I think. Did you have your hand up? No, no, no. No, OK, sorry, I thought, I thought there was an indication. No. Um, and Agis, how do you see the EU developing over the next decade uh, to address all these challenges that we've we've been discussing? I mean, it, it, it I mean, is. Do you see it? Do you, uh, do you see it uh, more tensions arising? Do you see it having? Does it have the capacity to deal with tensions of migration, for example, the economic tensions that we've talked about? Um, do you see a greater federalisation? Uh, what what do you do you see um, any do you think will come out of this decade with the EU in a different state than we've gone into it? Um, I, I think the main challenge for the EU is to uh, basically find the right balance between uh, agreeing to do uh, together all the things that it wants to do and basically accepting that some other things may be better done uh, on a national level. I think there is this, um, I think there's this duality in European societies today whereby, and many opinion polls show that, whereby uh, people are both uncomfortable with the EU in some aspects and also expect from the EU uh, to do uh, to perform some uh, to perform some things uh, for them, um, I think that what the way the 
a European Commission operates now, I think probably is um, the right way to look at things. I think there is uh, still a, there's a good understanding that some things do need to be seen in a more uh, strategic way. Uh, I think the EU is accepting that it lives, it lives in a world where a lot of the assumptions we made about uh, the rule of law, about international treaties, about our uh, Western norms and values being universally accepted, uh, this world um, doesn't, uh, this world doesn't exist anymore. But I would uh, actually expect the EU to be uh, perhaps uh, a bit more open that this uh, flex flexible view of the world also extends to the way that the EU uh, operates uh, operates on the inside. I think one one topic that we didn't discuss about much and that would be a uh, kind of a benchmark for this uh, in the future is the green transition. And I think that this is something very important, uh, particularly from a center-right perspective, if we uh, accept that th th there is a certain kind of coloring in, uh, in, our, meeting, um, in our meeting here. Uh, there is a big push uh, now, uh, the green transition by uh, its nature, it's also something that people operating on uh, supranational organizations uh, are very comfortable with, but I'm not sure many societies on the local level are comfortable with that. And the way that the EU will manage this balance between accepting some headline goals on an issue of a global importance versus not interfering or impacting too much on the way local societies uh, operate and local societies have learned uh, to live will be very, very, uh, will be very, very important. It's a very difficult balance to strike, but I think the EU should at least appear open that it is aiming or it is acknowledging the fact that there is a balance there uh, to be struck. Thank you. Can I, Tommy, can I come to you um, just to pick up on some of the points you were making about migration in, in the last five minutes or so that we have um, and the imbalance of the age of population north and south um, and we can imagine um, the we're going to have an, a greater influx maybe of refugees coming from um, the Afghan Afghanistan region and if you would if you could talk a bit about how the EU and Europe has learned to deal with those issues of migration and the compromise of the of the borders of the of, of the European con continent because that's a real challenge isn't it for us um, in the in Europe over the next yeah. two yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Indeed, that's a big discussion now, I'm sure also in the UK, but in the in European Union, Europe, how it will play out, how we, with this uh, Afghanistan uh, crisis will impact. Do we will see the 2015 repetition, huge flows on or to Europe with uh, then the respective uh, uh, political imp uh, impact. Uh, how it seems to be playing out, in fact, is that uh, that uh, first of all, many countries around, you need to be very blunt, many countries around uh, Afghanistan actually are quite, uh, you know, concerned themselves. Uh, they, they are not, they are not, uh, uh, you know, they don't want to take huge influx of uh, immigrants, immigrants uh, to the, their area. So that will definitely slow down. What did you know, of course, what we, when we think about Afghanistan situation, we think about 2015 and what happened then actually is that it was not that, uh, you know, the Syrian crisis started and the next day you started to have a, have a huge flux of people coming in. What happened is that, you know, you had people moving out slowly, slowly into Turkey and then it uh, played, uh, kind of started to play out. That could be the scenario what we are facing in continental Europe and maybe the UK that in two, three, uh, four years, then we will start to have uh, more people uh, coming in. But uh, in, 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 in essence, you know, we have a uh, of course, in uh, in terms of uh, politics and tactics and instruments, you know, the Frontex, the uh, the border guard system of the European Union is much more more stronger. The member states are much more uh, more prepared. Also, don't uh, don't forget that one reason for the crisis, I think, also in the UK, was that the internal systems and internal procedures within the uh, EU member states and in the UK were not prepared to such a flux of people. Now there is more experience. Also, some tough discussions have been taking place. So it uh, it is. Um, it is, uh, you know, most likely it will be easier uh, this time. But of course, this uh, challenge will not go away. As you mentioned, uh, you know, we will in the future years uh, and decades, we will see these flux coming, especially from Africa. And, and you know, some tough uh, moral answers needs to be answered. 
Yeah, lovely. Thanks. Listen, uh, gentlemen, um, this is this hour has galloped past, and I fear that we are have, we have come to the end of the time available to us. Uh, there are so many uh, so many questions that you have posed uh, that we could explore further, and uh, and I hopefully hopefully we will in the some university over the next few days. But can I just thank you um, for joining us today uh, and for giving us a really interesting tour d'horizon of the issues that uh, that are facing us. And, um, and hope that you will be joining us and with the rest of the audience for some of the other sessions coming up over the next days. Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand over to Felix, who will, I think, explore a bit of, of what's happening after this. Thank you very much, Caroline, and thank you all for your contributions. Um, I think it was good to set the scene and uh, it shows how much more debate is needed on all those topics. What we try to do throughout the next uh, days, um, you can all see in the program. Um, but, uh, but so the next session today, I hope uh, many of you can join us. That's session two at uh, five o'clock UK time. Um, that's on priorities emerging from global trends uh, 2030 and beyond. Um, that idea, that session will pick up on some of the things we have mentioned uh, now. And then we have further sessions. Please check uh, our program, which is online. And to keep up to date with the latest information, please follow us on Twitter. That is ideas underscore 2030 or on our website, www.ideasnetwork2030.com. There you will always find the latest updates and the latest versions of the programs as um, they keep shifting once in a while as we realize throughout the weekend. So thank you all for your rather short notice participation. I thank the audience for being with us and for Caroline for doing a superb job in chairing this opening session. And I look forward to seeing you back at three o'clock. Thank you very much.